Hey guys, good evening. We seldom meet this way after dinner in the evening. And I just wanted to take an opportunity to cover a story that we just saw over the last few days. And I just have a feeling that you're going to see a lot of this over the next 24 hours. So I wanted to give you a good foundation for how to view this story as you see it evolve. So let me go ahead and invite uh, Dr. Bound to what's going on. So we're just waiting for her. Dr. Daria, as you know, is a friend of mine and she is, an, there she is, an emergency room doctor. She's also a mom. Hey girl. Uh, we both had to run to try to get our kids to sleep so we could do this. <laughs> so this is, this is real life in action. <laughs> yes. I do have something I just want to, before we get to the serious stuff, I just thought I would share this while we have some folks join us. Um, I'm sitting outside because I needed a little change of pace. And I'm just looking over here. We have a little podium on our porch. And um, Dr. Daria, my coffee from this morning is, is right over there in a coffee. Cup. Let me show you guys the evidence just so that you know. <laughs> I'm sitting here. I'm getting ready. I'm going to be really with it. Here it is. There's still coffee in it. So well, you know, if you get sleepy, like if this drags on, Jenna, you're a little tired. Yes. You know, you're, you're fix. Yeah, exactly. So let me give everyone the backstory, um, Dr. Daria, because we actually talked about this this morning. And I was trying to figure out exactly what to do and how to position this story. As many of our audience knows with Smarter News, we don't want to put a bunch of clutter in front of you. And there's so many different reports regarding COVID-19 that you, we really just have to proceed with caution to make sure that we're giving everyone the best information. But mm -hmm. here's how this story has developed. And really what it's about is children and COVID-19 and something that we're learning. So uh, on Monday, the New York Health Department, the New York City Health Department released a bulletin that detailed what was going on with 15 patients in their system. Mm -hmm. And essentially it said, we're noticing similar symptoms with these 15 patients. They're all different ages. Some of them have tested positive for COVID-19, some haven't. Some have antibodies, some don't. But because of their similarities, we kind of want to flag this. And so that was Monday. And so we actually, we were emailing about this because this story stuck with me. I didn't want to put it in front of the Smarter News right away because I thought, well, it's just 15. How, what, is this a big deal? Um, but, this has developed really rapidly. So that was one report in the, the New York City Health Department. Uh, the New York Times covered it. Now we're seeing a larger report in the Washington Post where other doctors on the East Coast are mentioning, again, similar symptoms that these patients are experiencing. And this is also paralleling reports out of Europe. Again, not a very big group of children, but all different ages, otherwise healthy. And so there's questions about what is the role of COVID-19. Now, I've been vague about the symptoms because I thought that would be a great place to bring you in, uh, Dr. Daria. And I should also mention for the 15 patients that are in New York, they range from two years old to 15 years old. Uh, some of them are still hospitalized at the time. We have no fatalities as of yet. And just so everyone knows, we have more than a million positive cases in America with COVID-19 and about 21,000 of those cases are 18 and younger. So we're still talking about a very small percentage of overall COVID-19 cases mm -hmm. um, appearing, at least from right. what we know of testing. Exactly. exactly, and the reality is you and I were talking earlier today, we're not testing kids very regularly. So who knows what that denominator is? Right, and, and, and for, for parents out there, they'll definitely understand this. If you tested your child every time there was a respiratory <laughs> illness in them, you'd be giving them multiple COVID tests yeah. All the time, which we're just not doing. Things. We're yeah. just not doing right now. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about what, why are doctors raising a little bit of a red flag about this, mm -hmm. Dr. Dari? What are the symptoms that, that you're hearing about that you're seeing that you also feel, you know, that this is worthwhile right. discussing? Right. So we'll start with kind of the first half of your question, which is why doctors are raising the red flag. And it actually, it first kind of was raised by some doctors in Spain and in Italy. And then actually the Pediatric Intensive Care Association came out earlier this week, kind of they'd had a meeting and had a call and saying, hey, we're all seeing this. And one of the reasons why it's a little bit late that people are just kind of anecdotally talking about it is Kawasaki isn't a syndrome that we naturally report. We don't have a patient with and then report it to the Department of Public Health. No one's tracking it. So it was really kind of doctors talking person to person, hospital to hospital 
saying, hey, are you seeing this? We're seeing more of this. And is it Kawasaki? Were they using that saying this is Kawasaki syndrome because that's not some or disease? That's not something that I've really ever heard about. No, it's it, Kawasaki is, is very rare. And now now we've seen it more in the United States, as you mentioned, New York City and, and in Michigan. It, it's a very rare condition. Essentially, what it is, is your body has a haywire immune response. Your immune response goes haywire. It starts attacking the lining of your blood of certain types of blood vessels. And it's rare enough. We don't exactly know what causes it. They seem to think that it's a number of viruses could cause it. There are some different kind of toxins that they think may cause it, but we don't know exactly what. So it seems like there's some trigger and it causes your immune system to go haywire, much like in adults with COVID who are having complications from COVID, they're having that cytokine storm. It's a different mechanism, but the same idea that your immune system goes haywire and starts attacking these blood vessels and the symptoms go from there. So is it deadly? So the, it, the good thing is it's considered kind of a self-limited disease and that most kids, because this is typically 90% of people who get Kawasaki's are like, you know, five and under, 80 to 90%. They say that about most, it's about, after about 12 days, it tends to be self-limited, gets better on its own after 12 days. But there's a really small percentage of kids who are going to have complications. And so remember I said it breaks down the wall of your blood vessel. And so think about it, your blood vessels are like a hose, that inner lining. If somebody goes and starts to tear that up, you start to get aneurysms. And you can get aneurysms in the blood vessels of the heart. And that's where it can become deadly. Obvious. I mean, that's really serious. And now the, the American Heart Association came out today and commented about this as well. So you see, there, it's not just about one health department talking mm -hmm. about it. Now we're getting this sort of domino effect where we're seeing, you know, obviously very reputable sources talk more about it. Jody, who's joining us live, had a great question. She said, well, what do the symptoms yeah. of this even look like? Well, let, and let's talk. I want to finish just really quickly on that last one, the mortality. Mortality rate now with treatment is about 0. 0.1 to 0.3%. Okay. So this is a scary thing, but it's, again, so there, there is some reassurance. It is not, you know, as if we catastrophize. I wanted people to have that number. Of course, no number is, it's not zero. Zero is best, right? Zero That's what we would like, but right. Just to keep this in context, because headlines can be scary. So what are the symptoms? So one of the typical symptoms is fever of 100, say, say about 101.4 or higher for five days. And then, so here are some of the classic symptoms. So there's the, a rash. About 90% of kids will have a rash. Then about 90% of them will have kind of, uh, think of rash throughout your whole body. So your lips, dry, cracked lips. Your eyes are red. With, we have conjunctivitis. They have, can have like a redness of your mucosa inside your mouth strawberry tongue, which is kind of like a swollen red beefy tongue, and rashes on your palms of your hands and on your feet. So that's kind of the classic rash. You can have swollen lymph nodes in your neck and also then some of the more vague symptoms, you know, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, joint pain can happen. And also think if this does attack the heart, they're going to get lightheaded, uh, even pass out in some kids, lethargy, confusion. Well, what's interesting about what mentioned, oops, excuse me, is that it did not include a respiratory necessary component that we talked so much about with COVID-19, right? The dry cough. I mean, the fever, right. I know it's been kind of one of those symptoms that has come and gone, gone as like a, a lead symptom, but it doesn't sound like that. It sounds like something different. Right, and children. that's what they think. So in those kids in New York City that they, with, uh, with Kawasaki that they reported on, five of them had negative tests, about a third of them tested positive for having COVID now, and a third of them tested positive for having antibodies to it. So it's almost like Kawasaki's isn't, isn't COVID. COVID causes the symptoms of COVID, you know, the fever, the shortness of breath, all those things, that triggers your immune system to now have this new immune system flow and problem of Kawasaki's, if that makes sense. There are two different entities, one sure. just trigger. Interesting. So as a parent, how does this change your equation? I mean, obviously, you're going into the emergency room, you could potentially see this. Mm -hmm. But how does this, does this shift any ways that you're thinking about COVID-19 now? It makes me more aware. Um, it makes me think about what we're doing to make sure we're protecting our kids. Um, and it, de it definitely makes me decide to, to keep them a little more protected right now. I, I want to know more. Like, is there really a tie here? How direct is it? Who is most susceptible? And you know, when we talk about going back to school and things in the fall, it's not, I'm not saying, no, this means we can't go back to school. I'm saying, let's learn more and then let's find ways to protect our kids because 
yes, most of them will be totally fine with COVID. That, that still holds true, but there's a small percentage that could get these complications and we need to be really smart about it and think through that. Well, one of the things I know that we've talked about too is how deadly the flu season was this year for, for, uh, for children, specifically in the pediatric group. So we're talking about very, very young children historically a very deadly uh, flu season. So we're kind of keeping that also in mind because of course we're out of flu season. Now we're dealing with this new illness and we know we're going towards another flu season. One of the curious things I thought that was written in, and I believe it was the Washington Post that flagged this, was saying that where we're seeing children emerge with some of these symptoms in, is in areas where there's a high level of infection mm -hmm. and that first wave kind of crossed over. So, you know, we had this big spike in infections and it was in mid-April that we're sort of seeing this in the children. So it wasn't in the beginning when other people were suddenly seeing these high infection rates. And I'm just wondering what to make of that, if anything, um, because clearly these children didn't test positive for COVID at the very beginning, mm -hmm. if they tested it positive at all. So what, you know, medically, is there anything to those waves of a virus kind of coming and going and what you see at different points of yeah. the infection? Absolutely. So two things come to mind there. Um, one is think again, the timing. So a child would have had to have had the symptoms of COVID and then, you know, have that after being affected for five, 10 days, maybe longer, because we don't know exactly when, and then that would trigger Kawasaki. So Kawasaki is of course going to have a delay and then People aren't seeking care for it because they didn't know to look for this. They didn't notice that it was a thing. So again, you're going to have a delay in, in diagnosis for that. Um, secondly, we know one of the reasons they think Kawasaki's has an infectious cause to it of all the different things that could be causing it is we do see it kind of come and go in waves. We see it in the winter and we tend to see it in the summer. And they also tend to see it kind of go in waves of like epidemics, which makes them think that there is some infectious etiology underlying it and triggering the Kawasaki. Interesting. So for this, and just to be clear about that, you would still in the ER, would you still call this Kawasaki's or would you say if someone was also positive for COVID, would you call the patient COVID positive? Would you say they're both? How would you even determine kind of yeah. what category to put them in? So if they could turn positive for COVID, then yeah, if they're acutely positive for COVID, then yeah, you call them COVID and then you would treat them for the acute infection of COVID if they need you know, one of the acute treatments for it. I've heard some people call it Kawasaki, some call it Kawasaki-like, yeah. because I think they just don't know. Um, so either way, two different treatments, but you, you, treat, you treat for the clinical syndrome. If the patient has COVID, you treat for that. If they have Kawasaki's, you treat IVIG and aspirin, potentially steroids in some people, um, different, di different things. So, and I saw that as some of the treatment, um, we're all going back to the old fashioned aspirin, <laughs> right? Right here. We, I know it's a little different when you get it through an IV, but I'm just saying, here we are. I mean, um, we have a lot of great questions and I want to get to them in just a second as we wrap up, um, Dr. Daria, but what are you watching for next? Just as again, these are the initial reports. We've had kind of a flurry of 48 hours of information. What, what are you personally waiting for watching? So for? now people are reporting Kawasaki. So I think we're going to see a big bump in reporting because there are probably those people who maybe had just seen a couple and they hadn't, they hadn't told anything about it. So I think hopefully as people start reporting it, to, they're saying, if you think you have Kawasaki's, if you have a patient with Kawasaki's to report it to your Department of Public Health. So hopefully we're going to start to get an influx of data from the Department of Public Health. We'll start to be able to analyze that and, you know, work backwards to see when those kids got sick and, and if they have anyone recognized as COVID and if they needed treatment. For right. That. Is, are they in a household where there was COVID? Was it was just by chance. I mean, these are going to be big things. Do they have any pre-existing conditions? Because we know that's an issue with COVID-19. Great question from um, Kate Cliff 218 saying, are you concerned that we are all going to get sick because we're also isolated? We are used to being exposed to bacteria daily. We've seen this. We've seen doctors in California talk about this on video, that they're worried about a spike in infection as we kind of all come out of our homes because we've, we've sterilized ourselves to some extent. What are your thoughts on that? I'm not worried that we've sterilized ourselves. <laughs> I mean, I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old and I feel like they're always able to find germs somewhere. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So it's in true. today's world, I'm not worried about that. It is true that by going into lockdown and not exposing people, we do have some percentage of people who haven't been exposed to it. That if we had done run wild, go, you know, Bend for yourself, try not to catch COVID, have fun, you know, six weeks ago, yeah, a lot more people would be exposed to it. Um, that would have been irresponsible, though, because 
we still don't know immunity fully. Um, right. We don't, we're, you know, we're learning more, but we still don't know. We expect that there's some immunity, but we don't know how long it lasts. We don't know how complete it is. We don't know what the best treatments are. You know, four weeks ago or six weeks ago, we were treating these patients with a certain type of ventilator. Now we're doing different things and we're proning them and turning them on their front. There's just been the amount of medical advancements we've made in the last four or six weeks. They, we have bought ourselves time because this was a totally foreign invader. So we do risk people going out not having been exposed to it, but I hope we're gonna be smart about it. And I do feel that we're slightly better prepared than we were six weeks ago when we didn't even know where to get masks. Is it still a reminder about how early we are in the pandemic? though, that we're getting these reports about children. And here's the thing. I mean, it's hard. Listen, as a news consumer, but also as a journalist, this is hard. Initially, we're told if you're 65 and younger, you're fine. And then we're told, no, actually, the information from Europe is if you're, if you're younger than 65, you can still really get sick. And now, you know, we've been told, hey, children are, are affected very seriously. It's very rare. And yes, that's still the case. But if you do get sick, this could be really, you could get sick really quick. Right. And it's unnerving, you know, it's unnerving yeah. to kind of see those changes. It is. And I think that's why you and I, Jenna, are trying to be careful about the news we share with people. Right. I think we, we were a little hamstrung because we got some data from China and then we got new data from from Europe. And uh, I, my, my parents are texting me. I didn't know. <laughs> so hopefully that's not a problem. Um, I just got to call dad text. Dad, if you're watching, <laughs> hold on. Um, so, but there, so, we're, then we got the new wave of information from Europe, and that kind of changed some things we knew about it. So, so yes, that's part of the problem. And I think another part of the problem, there's a New England Journal of Medicine editorial that I was going to share with you anyways, Jenna. And it talked about part of the problem, you know, a benefit and problem is that because of this, since it's so new, there's this has been this influx of data, and we're not doing peer review. A lot of, do of journal articles are coming out without being peer reviewed right. with the goal of getting the science out there. But as a result, we're getting even more headlines than normal. With it's really easy to get like some headline whiplash, and then we look two weeks later, and well, yeah, that study wasn't the very best. So I think that's really hard, and I don't think it's necessarily the best. It's good for the scientific community, so we can stay up to date. I think it's hard for the the general public, which is wondering why the headlines keep changing. Yeah, it's such a good, it's such a good point. And your video on data is really good, so everyone should check that out at Dr. Daria. One quick final question before you run to your dad. I just had two final questions come up on the board about antibodies and immunity. Mm -hmm. And just curious, you're kind of, what, what do we know? What do you feel we know about any sort of immunity with exposure to COVID-19? How are you feeling about the data that we are seeing right now? So I do expect that there will be some degree of immunity. Um, if you look at SARS and you look at MERS, both of them people had immunity for about two to three years. So I don't expect that it is long term, um, but I think we'll have some short period of time. How complete it is, I don't know. I don't know that it's maybe 100% that if you get COVID now, you won't get again in the next year, but I think you'll be less, um, it'll be less severe, kind of like you know, if you, you get the flu vaccine and even if you get the flu, it's less severe because your immune system recognizes it. You can mount an immune, system, uh, immune response much faster. So I think we can probably expect some degree of immunity. How complete, don't know. And then if you get sick again, are you still contagious? We don't know that. We've got to figure that out too. And you can't blame anybody for not having that data. To be able to get that data of if you get sick and then convalesce and then do you get sick again, I mean, that's weeks and weeks and months of data people have to track. So we're not going to get that just yet. But that's what I expect. The one thing that could kind of throw a little question in there is the question of mutations. Up till this point, as you, you and I were talking, up till this point, we thought that the mutations were pretty insignificant and that they didn't make a, diff a huge clinical difference. Um, now there's talk that maybe there's one strain that's a European strain that has evolved. So I don't know, but I think overall, I'm optimistic that there will be some degree of immunity. But time waits. Okay, well that's good. And we understand it's developing, so that's good. It's just nice to have an honest conversation about <laughs> what we know, what we don't. So here's the headline again. There is uh, a, what, what is being called Kawasaki disease or Kawasaki syndrome or Kawasaki-like <laughs> symptoms that are arising in children, some of which have exposure to COVID-19, some of which who don't. And it's a little bit of a mystery, but of course, because these are our youngest, our youngest uh, community members, we want to protect them as best that we can. And so we're going to be watching this story really closely. In the meantime, mosquitoes are on me and a jackrabbit 
just went bouncing by. So we've really had a great wide audience tonight. You Dr. just Daria. the other day. I did. It's a buddy who lives in our front yard. I'm like, I'm growing up in San Francisco in an apartment. Do you ever think I'd be here? Like, oh yeah, there's my cup of coffee and like the jackrabbits just like well, bouncing by. Well, I just Jackrabbit Texas. follows at Smart Her News. Like, <laughs> That's right. And, Jackrabbit. and at, Dar at, at Dr. Daria, you guys <laughs> have to check her out 100%. Hopefully we'll do this a lot more. Let us know if you like this. And of course, maybe we'll jump on and answer some of your questions on a regular basis because we love that. But Dr. Daria, we love you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Oh, there she goes. Oh, Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Bye. bye, Dr. Daria. All right, guys, let us know what you think about that. And if you have any questions and concerns about the story that we just covered or any others, please direct message me or you could always email us hello at smarternews.com. Dr. Daria and I talk all the time. She's a great resource. So I highly encourage you to check her out and follow her um, because she is a doctor that also talks to other doctors. You know, there's some experts that don't want to talk to anybody else, but she's an expert. She's an emergency room doctor and she talks to other folks. And, you know, I really got to give her a thumbs up. I've worked with her for many years and, um, I'm really glad that she's able to share with you some of her knowledge. All right. Have a great night, you guys. And as always, more on smarternews.com. Talk to you later.